How's everybody today? Great. Uh, welcome to Star East 2014. Uh, my name is Lee Copeland. I'm the program chair. I'm also the official welcoming committee and uh, master of ceremonies and all kinds of stuff like that. I'm glad to have you all here. We have a few announcements that we need to take care of at the beginning of the day before we begin. I uh, want to acknowledge our sponsors. Our premier sponsor is TechWell. Uh, our platinum sponsors here are Capgemini, Cognizant, Keynote, IBM, HP, Mindtree, and Tata Consultancy. Uh, and then we have a host of gold sponsors and uh, silver sponsors. And most of these folks are appearing in our, uh, our expo, which is next door. Would encourage you throughout the conference to go visit with them, uh, listen to their spiel, check their wares. Uh, some of them give away stuff. And so uh, get some stuff. It's, uh, it's great fun. We appreciate our sponsors. They're uh, a great part of what makes the conference uh, economically possible. And so uh, hope you would go visit with them and, and listen to uh, what they have to say. I want to welcome our international delegates. If you're here from outside the United States, would you stand up? We'd, we'd like to acknowledge you. No, stand up. We want to. Whoa, look at all that. We welcome you all. Here's a list of countries uh, represented. I hope I, I didn't miss anybody. Uh, who here is from Utah? There we go. It's the, it's the Utah gang again. Um, that's, that's where I live these days. Uh, we welcome you here. Uh, this uh, list has grown over the years, and we're appreciative of the support that we get from uh, our delegates internationally. The, the percentage of uh, speakers uh, from outside the U.S. has also grown over the years, and we appreciate that. So, welcome. Glad to have you here. Hope you didn't get hassled too much by those uh, people in the, you know, the uniforms at the airport. I want to call your attention to the program guide. You each received one of these when you registered. And uh, the important thing is it's got today's schedule in it, and it's got a map of where you, all the sessions are and would encourage you to really make the conference your own. Look through the, the sessions, the simultaneous or concurrent sessions, uh, pick the ones that seem most appropriate for you and go to those. And a bit of advice that I'll give you that I gave to a group last night, and that is if you're in a session and it's just not doing it for you, you you're not getting out of it what you thought uh, you were going to, uh, we don't consider it rude at all to get up and leave and go find a better session for you. Uh, I, I would encourage you not to shout or scream or things like that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, really, use your time wisely and, uh, and find those sessions that will be best for you. And the descriptions are, uh, of course, in the program guide. I want to call your attention to a couple of uh, little ancillary features we have at the conference. First, it's called Presenter One-on-One. -on -one. This is your chance to actually meet with a testing expert uh, uh, people who are speaking on the program for a 15-minute slot. Uh, we're doing this today and tomorrow. Um, these speakers have volunteered their time. They're going to be sitting at tables, and you can sign up for a 15-minute slot with them. The sign-up's near the registration desk. There's a big board, and you just put your name down and pick a time slot and go sit and chat. You know, the uh, testing community is a very open and very welcoming community. It's unlike some that I have been involved in in the past uh, uh, that seem to be very closed. You know, if you were not one of the top five or ten experts in the world, you just weren't welcome. That's not the way the testing community is at all. We're very open and very friendly and would encourage you to take advantage of this. And you can just chat. You can get some free consulting. You can use this 15 minutes however you like. I encourage you to do that. Uh, this is the schedule for today, and you each have either underneath you or nearby you uh, a blue form that has all the details of the schedule. I don't expect you to, to write that down. Okay? We also have a Meet the Speakers lunch, where various speakers have been assigned tables, and they're going to talk about various topics, and you just go and sit and chat with them over lunch. And again, it's very informal and, and fun, and, and that schedule 
is uh, on the screen here, but it's also on the, the blue information sheet that you have. Would encourage you to do that. It's great fun. Uh, the testing expo is open today from 1030 to 2. And then they uh, have to take a rest from 2 to 3.30. The expo is closed. And then it's open again from 3.30 to 6.30. Again, encourage you to go visit the various vendors um, and see what they have to offer. There's going to be a reception tonight in the expo area between 5.30 and 6.30. There will be free food and drink. So, uh, again, you'll have a chance to visit the expo vendors there. Expo is open tomorrow, but limited hours tomorrow. It opens at 1030, but it closes at 3. So don't plan on going there, you know, after the conference finishes tomorrow afternoon because they will be long gone. So enjoy that. I hope you do. Uh, As you go through there, I encourage you to play the uh, Star East Passport game. You'll pick up a passport as you go in the door, and you take it around to various exhibitors, and they punch it. And then when it's uh, finally full... You take it to the TechWell booth and stick it in the raffle box. And uh, today at 5.45, you have to have it in the box by 5.45. And then at 6 o'clock, we will have a drawing, and you can win prizes worth up to dollars. And cool stuff. So, uh, But you have to be present to win. You've got to be there at 6 o'clock when your name is called. If you're not and you're a winner, well, you're not a winner. Somebody else will get a chance at it. So drawing at 6 must be present. Um, encourage you to visit uh, the bookstore. Breakpoint Books uh, comes to all of our conferences, and they bring scads of books, and uh, they're, they're experts on technical books. Um, they have a, a lot of really good stuff there. There's going to be a book signing tomorrow. Again, you'll get the details on the blue sheet. Some of the authors will be there to, to sign their books if you want to buy them, or just come by and chat with them for a few minutes. They're happy to chat. There's a bonus session tonight I want to call your attention to. Uh, Prakash and Diane are going to talk about best practices uh, in transforming to world-class QA and encourage you to do that. That's 6.30 tonight. Uh, Wi-Fi is available here, and the uh, Wi-Fi key is, is really cryptic. It's Star East 2014, so that'll help you with that. Sponsored by Capgemini. Again, notice how... Many of our sponsors have have sponsored things like Wi-Fi and lunches and breaks. And, again, we appreciate their support. Uh, If you want the mobile app, you can download that. And I just did this morning. It's a great tool to have. So uh, I encourage you to do that. It's got descriptions of all the sessions, bios of the speakers, the full schedule for the conference, uh, everything you need in one electronic form. If you tweet, uh, follow us on Twitter. Hashtag Star East is the place to look there. Um, Sandy, would you come up? This is Sandy Sue, who is our uh, social media expert, and she's going to talk about uh, a little contest that we've got going. I think you'll find it interesting. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lee. So I'm going to make this really quick. As you can see up on the screen, we do have a social media contest going on and you could win one of two great prizes. So someone's gonna go home and make their kids really happy with an Xbox One or a Kindle Fire. So basically there's really four steps to enter. You just need to follow us on Twitter. So that's Sticky Minds and TechWell. Tweet your top takeaway. I'm sure you have more than one, but you really only need one to enter. And then record a short testimonial. So you can do that on Instagram. Uh, and tag Star East or come by our video booth. So it's really simple. You just have to go to the video booth and share your takeaway and then complete your entry at the TechWell Expo booth. So the contest actually starts, um, you can start recording the videos at any time and you can come by the video booth starting today at 4.30 until, and then tomorrow it's going to be open from 8 to 3. So if you have any questions, you can also just tweet me um, at Sticky Minds or TechWell and I'd be happy to answer. And since I'm up here, I just want to do one thing. So if everyone can smile and say Facebook. And you can find this photo. It'll be on our TechWell Facebook page. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Sandy, do you have to do all four? Uh, you, yes, you have to do all four. That was a question. So the steps that you see there is what you need to do to enter. Okay, all four steps. Yes. All right, good. So don't do three and expect to be a winner. All right. Thanks, Sandy. Appreciate that. Um, 
want to remind you of uh, our Friday uh, Testing and Quality Leadership Summit. Um, many of you have already registered for that, but if it's something you now decide you'd like to attend, there is an extra fee for that. But it's not too late to register. Just stop by and see folks at the registration desk. They'll be happy to help you out. Also on your chairs are little green forms. We call them affectionately the green form. It's a session evaluation form. And I would ask you in every session you're in, both the keynotes and the concurrent sessions today, to take a few moments at the end and uh, write down the speaker's name or the, uh, the identifier for the session and then uh, give some feedback. Um, numeric feedback on the front, but what speakers really find useful are the comments that you put on the back. Uh, you like this, you didn't like this, you wish there were more of that, you wish there were less of, of something else. And, and these ultimately find their way back to the speakers. They will get these green sheets, and they really appreciate it. So if you would take just a few moments at the end of each session, we would appreciate that. All right, there will be a conference evaluation form that we'll hand out tomorrow. And again, we would appreciate your taking a couple of minutes and giving us some feedback at the conference level on uh, uh, what you like and uh, areas for improvement. I've already heard uh, a couple of both positive and negative comments from delegates yesterday and, and encourage them not to just leave it with me because I'm old and I'll forget, but to write it on the form. I, I don't know about you. I have been to some conferences where I felt that kind of the moment I filled out the form, it, it just kind of went in the shredder. Um, but that is not the case here at SQE. We pay close attention to these. After the conference, we'll go through them. And then we bring them off the shelf in about six months and look at them again to see if we see any patterns or things that we could improve. Many of the things that we do at this conference did not come from our great brains, but in fact came from some suggestions from you folks on the conference eval form. So if there's something you'd like to suggest, please feel free to do that. We'd love to have your input. All right, uh, Wade and Paul. Um, we're running a testathon, and these gentlemen are going to give us some uh, a, a quick spiel about what that's all about. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so the testathon, also known as the test lab, you'll see we've got on the test lab coats, hence the lab coats. Um, so we're at a testing conference. We're going to be talking a lot about testing. You're going to be hearing lots of really great ideas. So we've actually got software out in the uh, lobby out there to actually test something. Um, get your hands dirty. We've got a bunch of laptops. You can bring your own laptop. Um, we've got a few different pieces of software. The main thing that we're, we're working on, which is the other cool part of what we're doing, is the humanitarian toolbox. So this is a um, nonprofit company that's writing software to help in crisis situations. Uh, for example, there's an earthquake and you have a bunch of volunteers that come to help dig people out of the earthquake. The, we've got an app to help the people running the situation kind of manage that. And um, there's lots of things that need to be tested. There's lots going on in there. Uh, we also are doing a bit of a contest. Whoever finds the most bugs, we've got some prizes and things going on. And if you find a bug, you get to squeak the rubber ticket. <laughs> So if you hear the chicken, or we've got uh, cowbells and all sorts of stuff and buttons going on out there, so stop by, uh, even if you've just got a little bit of time to, to poke your head in and uh, test around a little bit. We'd love your help, and as would Humanitarian Toolbox. Thanks. So. The uh, test lab, it's just an open space. There's no pressure. There's no vendors. The things that you try or that you learn the sessions just come and practice and play. And as Wade was saying, you know, the Humanitarian Toolbox is a great app to try some of the fabulous new things that you're learning. Thanks. Hope to see you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I think they had me at the chicken there. Um, this would be a good time to silence your cell phones, uh, put phasers on stun, all those kind of uh, appropriate things. I um, uh, want to now welcome the, uh, the virtual conference. We've got... Uh, hundreds of people all over the world who are now going to join us for some of the presentations today. And we want to welcome you out there in virtual land. It's good to, good to have you. And, and uh, um, Teddy Bear says hi. Um, I'm pleased now to finish the announcements. 
and introduce our opening keynote speaker, and this is Randy Rice. Randy and I have known each other for more years than, than I can count. He's going to talk today about principles before practice, how to transform our testing by understanding key concepts. And let me just read uh, some of the official bio for Randy here. Leading author, speaker, and consultant with more than 30 years of experience in the field of software testing and software quality, Randy has worked with organizations worldwide to improve the quality of their information systems and optimize their testing processes. He's co-author with Bill Perry of a book called Surviving the Top Ten Challenges of Software Testing, and he's got another book called Testing Dirty Systems. Both of these are well worth your time. Uh, he's an officer of the American Software Testing Qualifications Board, founder and principal consultant of Rice Consulting Services, um, and, a, and a good friend uh, personally and a good friend of testing. It's my pleasure to introduce Randy Rice. Thanks, Lee. I remember the first time Lee introduced me, said that we had been fast friends for at least eight hours. <laughs> that was at a Star West. So it's a pleasure to be here with you. And so I'm going to dive right in. There was a, a deal that I did as a lightning keynote. And um, it was rather popular. I think people could kind of relate to it. So uh, I want to kind of start off with this. It really does have a tie-in to what I'm going to talk about. But, you know, it occurred to me one day that I've spent many, many years teaching what to do, how to do, and it didn't seem to really have much effect. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe if I could teach what not to do, you know, and be sure not do these things, maybe that might work. So I came up with this really thing, a kind of a backwards logic kind of uh, top ten list of ten proven ways to demotivate your team. Um, how many managers do we have in the house today? Okay, you guys are going to love this. Okay, so the first one is to, you want to make sure that you set these really super hard, unreasonable stretch goals. And you do that just to see how long people will try to do it before they give up. And then number nine is never explain your rationale for decisions. People don't need to know that. That's all within your head. You don't need to share that information. Uh, assign meaningless tasks. I mean, people have to look busy. If they're not busy, they're not happy, right? So we need that. And then no matter how good something is when someone gives it to you for review, always find several ways to criticize it. And that way, then, they'll just quit trying to put forth their best effort first and just give you whatever they can give you, and you just have to deal with the results. Uh, the number six one is one of my favorites. Take all the credit for yourself. No matter how many people were involved, no matter what they did, long hours, you get the credit. And number five, solve problems by building a brand new bureaucracy. I mean, every company needs a new bureaucracy every now and then, right? Plenty of forms, you know, that you have to fill out. And then be sure to listen to your team, kind of like a brick wall where you have an open door policy and they come in and they talk to you and then you kind of forget what they said because you actually know best. And then uh, when someone comes to you with a good idea of how to do the job a little better, maybe a tool to use, nah, don't worry about that one. Uh, you, you know the, your best way. And never expect your team members to get sick you know, because they're just like robots. They never break down. Never expect them to have any kind of special needs that they have to go take care of. And finally, the number one, never ever in any circumstances give anyone praise or recognition. Okay? That is the golden rule to demotivate your team. Okay. Now, I want to kind of explore an idea with you here. And the, the, the real idea behind this talk is that I, I think sometimes we try to get to the point of applying things that we've learned, and maybe even some things that we haven't truly learned before they're fully fleshed out, before they're fully baked, and even before we fully understand them. So have you ever tried to do something 
And then you realized, I don't know how. You know, my boss told me how to, that I needed to do this, but I have no idea. Haven't been trained, haven't read a book, or even worse, you don't know why. You, you don't know why you've been asked to do this thing. Well, maybe another thing, another way to see this ha would be, have you ever gone to a training class, left the class, asking yourself then, what did I really learn? You know, and some of you guys have already been here two days, right? You've gone to two days of tutorials, great tutorials. And um, I always tell the people when I do a Monday tutorial that, believe it or not, today, just four days from now, will be a faint memory in your mind, okay? So you need to do things to anchor the information and to, to really be able to uh, maybe even better, two weeks or three weeks from now, remember that day I was sitting in that tutorial session or that track session or that keynote session? What was the big thing I picked up? Now, why is this important to you? Well, I believe it will truly transform your skills, your career, and I don't have it on the slide, but therefore your life. Because I think once we learn how to learn, and that it's not just this quick and easy process all the time, that I, I think we can really embrace and do the work it takes to really truly master something. And the something I'm talking about is testing. I, I have a feeling that we've kind of drifted a bit in how we practice testing. And it's no one's fault. It's just that we tend to apply things in many different ways and we kind of play around with techniques and we really sometimes don't take the time to really get our heads into the techniques. So I, I heard an analogy one time, this was many, many years ago. You know, it, it's funny how so many of my stories start out that way, many years ago. Uh, but I heard a, a fellow talking about the idea of principles. And he said, if I wanted to teach you how to wash dishes uh, and do it in a very methodical way, I could teach you how to wash fine china, flatware, sharp knives, uh, plastic dishes. I could teach you how to deal with every kind of situation you would need to know to wash a dish. Uh, and all the utensils and the cookware, or instead I could teach you principles and then give you the ways to adapt those methods to the things that you're working with. Now, of course, some Weisenheimer typically says, I just throw them in the dishwasher. But see, even there, I have another principle. And I, I really don't understand this. Uh, this is one of those kind of observational humor kind of things, I guess. But why do you have to wash the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher? Does anyone ever else ever wonder that? I mean, uh, they say that you don't have to. But I know when you pull them out and you haven't done that, you, you see, you just, the, the cheese is still there. But anyway, I'll have to leave that for another time. Things like, you know, you rinse off the big things first, the big pieces of food, and then you save the really greasy, messy stuff until the end, because if, if you do those first, then you're constantly changing your water, and you don't want to do that. You want to use hot water, but not too hot, because if you do, you're going to burn yourself. And especially be careful with sharp objects in sudsy water. Some of you have experience with this as well. You know, surprise, surprise, you know, you get cut. Now, these are just a few little principles you can apply, and they, they will apply to many situations. Now, in testing, we kind of have some principles that I think we can fall back on. I'll give you a few of my personal ones. One thing is, is that it's good to do some sampling, especially early in a project, to see where maybe the big defects or the big problems seem to be. They're not all like toxic waste like this, but still, we can kind of get an idea of where to focus our efforts. And also, it's a good idea to not tackle the most complex things first. You know, you need to have a little time, start simply, get to know each other, get to know the product. And simple tests are good at first, and then you can always build on those. Uh, I'll, and always realize that you can have strong tests, but those tests are going to grow weaker over time. That's the basic 
Boris Beiser's uh, per pesticide paradox. And it's because that those tests become ineffective because you found about, about as many defects as that test is going to find. So you're always going to have to be adding new tests into your library. Now, uh, if any of you were involved in this project, please forgive me. It's become the new poster child uh, for, for the need for testing and, and project uh, health and management. But um, early testing is good, except when the thing you're testing isn't even ready for early testing. Okay, we kind of pick up this mantra, early testing is good, early testing is good, early testing is good. But uh, I don't know about you, but I've tested some things early, and I've tested them a lot of times because they just weren't ready. Uh, they were not fully baked at the time. Here's one that, that this came out of my mouth at a, I was teaching a, an automation class, and it just kind of hit me one day, and I just kind of blurted it out. Test automation is not automatic. Now, you might want to take this one back to your management <laughs> because I think the perception is, especially at the higher levels of the organization, is that there's some kind of magic automation wand that someone has. Uh, now, now, I know in government they, there's a magic IT wand they believe exists. We'll just wave it over and, you know, all of a sudden we can change all the tax rates and everything or... In automation, the same thing. We'll just wave this, uh, this magic automation wand, and all of a sudden, uh, we don't need, to need those testers anymore. Now, there are some other implicit principles that I've come up with over the years, and um, I would encourage you to come up with your own list. But, you know, not every failure is a defect. You know, we see unexpected behavior, and, uh, you know, it's the old thing. Is it a bug or a feature? Uh, it could be just the way I have the test set up. Maybe I had it set up incorrectly. Not every test can or should be automated. There are truly some tests that you want hands on the keyboard, eyeballs on the screen, and some tests maybe can't be automated. So this expectation of 100% automation is really kind of unrealistic when you think about it. And test automation doesn't replace the need for manual testing. There, as I said, there's still needs for that. And basically what happens is, instead of getting rid of the testers, you know, like management may want to do, what it does is it shifts skills and it shifts roles. And here's one of my favorites. It doesn't matter how good your test is if you're testing the wrong version. Uh, you guys have been bit by that one, I can tell. Uh, see, this is the tie-in between configuration management and testing, and configuration management is that thing that we often are challenged with because everything's changing all the time. And so, therefore, you know, it's kind of easy sometimes to pick up the wrong version and start testing it. Now, here's what we want, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak for you, but I'm going to speak for you through the people that I have heard from, and this is kind of the general idea they express. They want to go from a level where they have little knowledge about something, whether it be testing or whatever, to this level of mastery in about a week <laughs> or less. Eye, eyeglasses in about an hour, okay? Now, what, you know, we expect this to happen and our management sometimes expects this to happen and so they will schedule a two-day course at least once a year uh, for you to go to. And, of course, that's not nearly enough time for training and to be effective in, in learning. Uh, it's, it's really more like immersion and repeated dosages and just going and continually learning. Uh, this is really more what it looks like. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you, but I hate this game. I hate Candyland, and I'll admit it in front of you, God, and everybody, online audience. <laughs> The, the reason, I don't know about you, if you like this game or not, but, you know, I play it sometimes with my grandkids. And, you know, you go along the little path there, and you land on a color, and you may actually advance some colors. But what happens on some colors? You have to go all the way back. You know, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And it's really kind of hard sometimes to reach the total end of this game. And sometimes I just give up. I say, you kids, go ahead and play. I'm going to... You know, Papa's going to go do something else right now. So uh, I had an occasion a, a few months ago to uh, work on a very involved test design of a very complex system. And so a friend of mine uh, 
was working with me to design these tests. And if you've ever hung around me very much at all or been in my classes, you know my big deal is to get the most testing from the fewest number of cases. Okay, I, I see very little value in having large numbers of, of test cases just for the fact that we can say we have large numbers. I try to get the biggest bang for the buck. And we would we were trying all kinds of things to really get to the best set of tests that we could. And I would, you know, I'd write out a kind of a little sample test and then Jim would too and I'd say, no, that won't work. Why not? It won't scale. Oh, okay. So we tried a few other things. That won't work. Why not? It's too complex for the users to perform. And so we kept going back and forth on this and it, I just really came away with, once again, this reinforced idea that you know, testing is very nuanced. There are a lot of variables on your projects that allow you to, or force you actually, to select certain techniques over others, maybe apply a technique you've used for years differently and in a new way. And so really, in, in essence, all testing is context driven because there are a variety of things and some of them are very, very small things that require you to make a big change in how you do your testing. And so, uh, here's how it typically plays out when it comes to training. So, we have these learning objectives, and you have this brilliant instructor in the front of the room imparting their golden gems of knowledge to you, as Lee calls us, the silver tongue orators. And uh, we have exercises to reinforce the ideas, you know, so we're even practicing in the class, okay? And we have stunning visual aids, as you can see. Meanwhile, on the front row, we have Susie. Now, what Susie is trying to do, and you can see all the information she's trying to retain. She's trying to learn from the exercises. She's trying to remember what the instructor says. She's trying to remember what's being shown on the visual aids. And then the big challenge comes is she then, a week later or a day later, whatever, like many of you at this conference are going to take these ideas and try to apply some of them in their own workspace. And we come back to the idea, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know why I'm doing it, and there's a reason for that, and that's what I want to really explore with you. I put this in especially for you, Lee. Mr. Osborne, may I be excused, my brain is full. <laughs> How many of you have ever felt that way? You know, you've been in a class and you've just, you just, some of you may feel that way already here at the conference. Your brain is stuffed. And it's not only the stuff in the class, but we're in an age of information overload. I mean, emails, texts, tweets, all kinds of stuff. You know, oh, I've got to go check my Facebook account because I made a comment and somebody else may be commenting on my comment, you know. And so we have all this stuff rolling on in our heads. We have voicemail. We have things we got to do. We have a to-do list that's never done. And so it all gets real messy up here. And plus, I, I, I'll be quite honest. I have two or three people going around up here, even right now. So, um, but it gets worse, okay? Instead of Susie on the front row, we have a whole class of people uh, that are trying to retain this. And they're all trying to apply it in many ways. And it's going on over a passage of time. Uh, and during this passage of time, I mean, I've done training before in companies, and a month later they reorg, or the next week they reorg. And now the, all these people are gone into different teams, not even doing what I trained them to do. So many things change, and now you're kind of left out there still trying to figure it out. Now, for those of you who have had any kind of experience in instructional design or training or, you know, education, you'll know about this thing called Bloom's Taxonomy. And there's, there's several levels to it. I'm just going to talk about the first four. But at the lowest level are the things that you remember. Those are called the K1s. Those are the facts, okay? You, re, you know what a regression test is. K2 is where we get into what I believe is probably one of the, the most important and critical levels in this taxonomy are the, the principles, the concepts, and the theory. Now, we tend to minimize that stuff because it's, it's theoretical, right? But, if, but this is where we get the why we do what we do. 
And then once we can get the why down and, and a firmly established way to do things, then we can get up to the principles, I mean to the practices, the, the level three where we do things, and finally up to the level four where we can analyze and assimilate things. So it builds from the bottom up, and these first two form the foundation of what we do. If we move too quickly from the foundation, jump too quickly into the do, the level three, this is supposed to be reinforcement of the lower levels. But what it turns into be is kind of this diving into the deep end of the pool experience. And it's not until we reach this fourth level that we start to experience mastery. This is the level where someone can say, no, it's not that way. We probably need to do it this way. Why? Because it's too complex. What we're doing is not the right fit. And this is the thing that almost makes it seems like, okay, it's almost Zen-like in a way. That, that how, do they, how do they know that? Well, it's because they spent a lot of time in the foundation, a lot of time in the foundation, and then they moved on to the practice when they were ready. Now, actually, it's iterative, okay? You pick up concepts, and then you practice them. You pick up more concepts, and then you practice them. So, what does it take to climb K2? <laughs> kind of silly example here, but this is really K2, but a different K2. Now, people normally dislike the conceptual level of learning, okay, uh, because it is rather theoretical, uh, typically not a lot of hands-on going on here, uh, and you have to get your head into it. You really have to think about some of the deeper issues. And, it, you know, you, you want to start doing something. You know, you want to start putting things into practice. Um, but here's the thing. It takes a while to do that. It, it takes a while to build this basis of understanding. So here's what I hear from the students. They, they'll say things like, well, let's just, just show me how to use the tool. Okay, okay, okay. I can show you how to use the tool. Um, I, what I hear from management is, well, we want a course that doesn't have a lot of theory in it, all practical application. We want them going in and using the, the concepts the next day. Fine. Okay. Noble goal. I, and I'm not against the goal. I, I believe that people do need to put into practice what they learn. But here's the problem. A little time goes by, and it doesn't have to be very much at all, a week, a month, or whatever. Then I start to hear things like, well... We don't really know how to design the test for our applications. You know, the case study was was for such and such, and we we need to learn on our stuff. So, you know, I try to teach them on their applications, but sometimes that's even impossible because even in the same company, everyone's coming from different areas. And so if I focused on one of their applications, I'd be leaving out the others. The managers will say, well, the students passed the exam, but they're still struggling in how to perform the techniques. Yeah, that was because we were cramming to take an exam. We were not really trying to focus on reinforcement of practice and concepts. Now, let's take a little branch off here for a minute. Think about this. And this really surprised me when I first learned that Tiger Woods has a golf teacher. Now, for those of you who play golf, I'm sure it makes perfect sense. I don't play golf, but I thought, you know, this guy should be giving lessons not taking them, and you can see the, the teacher is, you know, showing, showing him the you know, correct positioning of his head and everything, and, but it's not just Tiger Woods, it's other champion level athletes, swimmers, baseball players, basketball players, they all have coaches for the thing that they do, and the reason for that is the coach brings objectivity, accountability, because they'll ask, how much have you practiced today? Not this week, but today. And they, they have a context that the player doesn't have. They may have been in a dozen championships. And this may be the player's first one. So they kind of bring this bigger uh, learning to the, to the person. Now, th there's also another example I would like to give you from music. Now, it's possible to learn how to play an instrument simply by mimicking someone else. Um, you may have seen the five little Chinese kids on YouTube playing the 
classical guitar quintet. A little creepy, but, you know, they, they could do it. it. It's called the Suzuki Method. And when I was in college, I was a... Um, uh, I was a math major, but I spent a lot of time in the music department, and I took three years of classical guitar. And my guitar teacher used me as kind of his test subject, and so he taught me by the Suzuki method. And I could play several classical pieces, and I would play in recitals and juries and things like that. And he was showing me off to the other teachers. At times, it kind of felt weird, like, do I need to go, ee, 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 you know? <laughs> but it does work. Now, the problem is, you know, whether you learn how to play a song off of YouTube or whatever, you're still only able to play specific songs in specific ways. Like, if you were to join up with a band, and now they're going to play, I don't know, Stairway to Heaven in a different key, you're lost, because you only know it in one key. Um, and the thing about it is, a lot of people don't truly appreciate that World-class musicians, m many of them, I'm not going to say all of them, but many of them understand music theory. And when you hear them talk about other musicians, they, they talk about how much they know about the, the theory of music. And everything is based in scales and tunings. And the, these guys, you know, you don't see that, okay? What you see is the performance. You see them do these amazing riffs. They couldn't do those riffs if they didn't know the scales, so, I asked a, a good friend of mine who plays with professional golfers, really what sets these professionals apart from the rest of us? And he said, very simply, one word, practice. They practice all the time. Professional golfers, they're at the driving range nearly every day. They play around on most days. Football players, they practice not only in good conditions, but in extremely harsh conditions. The military, they, they practice in the harshest of conditions. They train in the harshest of conditions because they never know that may be the situation that they find themselves in. So how do we practice as testers? Well, we can try some new approaches. We can test something new. And I know some of you have no control over this in your office area, but you can always do something on your own and, and try something new. Uh, you can dive deeper into something you already know. This is one of my favorite things, is to, to try to find a new angle on a, a technique that I already thought that I knew. Um, be a beta tester. Beta test a new technology. Once again, I know you have limited time. You have things to do at home. But it is a way to expand and to practice. And playing mental games. You know, just to keep your mind sharp. Games that require you to deduce things, to uh, draw connections, to associate things. Uh, th these are all pretty good. Now, I'm going to give you two examples real quickly of just what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and I do this with a little bit of uh, fear and intrepidation because <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many of you guys know... Um, very much about this first technique. So I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to try to explain this in one slide in about 20 seconds. So in pairwise testing, what the idea here is that you have a, a variety of conditions, and each one of them may work fine independently. Okay, we're used to going down the list, aren't we, and testing various conditions. But the problem comes in is when condition A and condition B get combined, ooh, they don't work so well together or B and C, or A and C. So, now, this is very contrived. This is like three things. Think about if you have hundreds of conditions that could all be associated like this, and the number of combinations is like astronomical. Well, uh, the, the idea here is that the research has shown that most of the defects we miss, and there's been at least, I think, 20 projects now, 20 research studies done on this, most of the research shows that about over 90% of the defects we miss in testing could be found just by testing the unique pairings. Okay? Now, oh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Why do we need to know this? Oh, okay, good question, Timmy. Here's an example that James Whitaker has in his book, How to Break Software. And, and this is an example that I love to give to people, and they say, I'm going to take this today to my manager. I'm going to show it to him. So this is the Internet Options dialog from Internet Explorer. 
if you go there to set your browser options and you click on this crazy advanced tab, you'll see somewhere, depending upon the version of Internet Explorer you're using, 53 binary conditions, checkboxes, uh, one set of radio buttons with three options, one set with four options, and so the formula there is 2 to the 53rd power or 9 quadrillion plus times 12 gives you 108 quadrillion plus possible combinations of conditions. Okay? Now, to put that in perspective, at one second per test, it would take you over 300 trillion years, over 12 trillion days, and over 34 billion years to test all possible combinations of just that one dialogue one time. Okay, and that's why IE has bugs. Okay. <laughs> and it's why uh, we can't do complete testing. We run into similar problems. Now, I know this is an extreme case of compression here, but I took the very same problem and put it into pairwise, and with some very complex test cases, mind you, 53 conditions and then two others, 54 55 conditions, I could come up with seven uh, test cases with just all the unique pairings. Now, this makes some people really, really happy and excited. Okay, some people say, yay, this is going to be our main technique now. Yay, we've, we've, we have uh, split the atom. And it scares other people to death. Because they say, you mean to tell me you went from 108 quadrillion down to seven? Seriously? So... Um, the question comes up, well, why pairwise and why not tripwise? Well, it's once again just based kind of on research that the triple mode defects are much more rare than the double mode defects. But here's kind of the, the interesting good news is it's possible to do both, okay? Uh, let's say we're selling t-shirts and we have five color combinations, six sizes, nine shipping methods, two tax uh, options, six payment options, and two coupons. Yeah, yes or no, we're applying coupons. I might choose to test these three in a three-wise manner and these three in pairwise. And if I did all combinations, it would be over 6,000 test cases. If I did all pairwise, it would be 54. And if I did the combo approach here, it would be 270. And 270 is still a lot better than 6480. And if I feel better that I have a stronger level of coverage, you know, that, that's just a bonus. Now, there are some tools. This is from uh, the Axe tool from NIST where you'll see there in red where you can actually choose that I want to do a mixed strength and I can pick which parameters I want to apply that to. Now, if you want that tool, it's free. You just go out to... Google and Google Axe Tool NIST, and you'll find it. You have to email uh, Rick Kuhn to get it, but but once you get it, you can run it on Windows, and it's a it's a neat little interface, and will do the job for you. Now, in pairwise, there are some considerations. Not every combination will work out logically. Okay, so like if I if I was testing a real estate application, and condition one was where I'm at, like urban or rural. Condition two is what kind of building it is, high-rise versus ranch. And condition three is does it have a pool or a pond. I run into test case three that has a rural high-rise. Now, I don't know. There could be some, you know, Illuminati genetically modified food organization building a skyscraper out on a farm somewhere. I don't know. But it may be an unfeasible combination. But here's another spin on it, too. I had a client that was working on a very similar situation, and no matter what we did, because they had 15 broker types, we would wind up with over 2,500 tests. One day, someone looked at it and said, hey, you know what? We can take those 15 broker types and actually come up with five equivalence classes. And just that one thing, no pairwise involved at all, took us down 67% to 840 so what I'm getting at here is if you take a basic technique and then start really exploring it, you can come up with some pretty interesting spins on how to do it. Now, you know, it becomes important how we factor things together, of course, and we need to know what are correct outcomes. Maybe there is a provision for a high-rise building on a farm. 
But before diving into something, a particular technique, you always have to ask, does it make sense in the situation? And are we willing to deal with the downsides? Like in pairwise, do we use these as negative tests or what? And really importantly, what do the stakeholders think about these techniques? And are we willing to accept the trade-offs? Now, real quickly, the number two uh, example is risk-based testing. And we all do risk-based testing. You know, it's like packing a suitcase. You put the big important stuff in first and the little important stuff in around that. And hopefully you can get everything in the suitcase. And this allows us to focus in the high risk and maybe give lesser uh, emphasis to the more trivial things. Uh, and it also helps us identify new risk and trace them through the test. But what if everything you test is a high risk? <laughs> you know, a weather radar system or a medical device, an MRI machine. It's kind of hard to find things that aren't very critical in those applications. Uh, yes, Timmy, all testing is probably risk-based at some level, but it's hard to find the risk in some cases. So let's take this case where we have all these test cases and we segment them out like we're saying, and you know, we'd test the high risk first and the moderate, then the low. But then what happens if we do a system test and we do a transaction that kind of spans these cases that span high, moderate, and low. Now we have to totally change our view of risk from a case level to a scenario level. And maybe even then everything, every scenario is a high risk. Now, how do we put all this into practice? We, we've seen that we, we have to adjust our methods sometimes. And it's it's possible to do that. A few expectations. Okay, this is not an easy process that I'm about to show you, and it's not automatic or instant. It's not like losing weight easily. I, I've got a little hobby where I like to take pictures of crazy signs around where I live. And I'll just let you read that for a second. Without no exercise. It doesn't make me proud of where I live. <laughs> but when you pass a sign like that, you know, you just can't help it, you know. I mean, this is one of those, you gotta get out of the car, get close up and take the picture. You know, you just can't resist this. You can't make this stuff up. Now, I thought a good example of this idea of mastery. I have a nephew, Michael DeVore, lives up in Colorado Springs. Michael went to, uh, Pepperdine to study art. And after Pepperdine, he went uh, to the Florence Academy of Art for about three years. And this is one of his recent paintings called The Quilter. And um, it's, a, I, I think, a gorgeous painting. He used a quilt that my wife um, gave them as the, the model for that quilt. And um, I thought it would be interesting to see what his work looked like in college. So I asked him, can you send me one of your pictures that you did in college? I said, okay, that's interesting. Here's another one, of, just to kind of show once again the contrast of what working under the tutelage of masters intensely for a period of time got him. He makes his own paints, he makes his own canvases, and um, the, the realism is just stunning. It totally changed the way that, that he did his, his painting. Um, now, here's the thing. The, the, the mastery of something is not a classroom deliverable. I can't give it to you in a book. I can't cram it into your head. Mentoring and coaching can help, but they can't motivate you externally. I want to refer you to a book, and I'm sorry I didn't um, uh, get this out alerted to the, the book table, but uh, it's easily available. Tim Galway, he wrote a book on the inner game of tennis. And another one on the inner game of golf. And so executives like to play tennis and golf, right? And so they started reading these books. And they started contacting Galway to do executive coaching in their, in their companies. Major, major companies like AT&T and, and such. And Galway realized that the same thing that causes a player to kind of lose confidence in their game and to lose their game entirely sometimes is the very same thing that makes companies dysfunctional and the very same thing that makes us doubt what we know and how we can learn. So 
he came away with some practices of, or some observations of what he's seen in players that he's coached. And the thing is, he says, you know, I can teach a tennis player how to hold a racket. And I can sit there and say, you're doing it wrong. But the player, they know what feels comfortable to them. And eventually, they're going to wind up doing what feels comfortable to them, or they're going to resist what you're teaching so much that it's going to be ineffective. So the coach that I just spoke so highly of can provide tips and advice, but you know best what works for you. And in fact, coaching, unless it's fact-based and non-judgmental, can maybe do more harm than good. Um, This is really a mental process more than anything else, and I want to introduce you to two people. And in Galway's book, he calls the first one self one. Now, this is your critical inner voice. This is the one that says you're doing it wrong. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be an inner voice. <laughs> Sometimes it can be an external voice, like your boss or your coworker or someone else. You're doing it wrong. Now, self two, this is the one that this is your true self. Knowing the things you know, the best ways you work, where you're comfortable. And as they're saying you're doing it wrong, you're saying, yeah, it doesn't feel right, but I don't like your way either. And so what happens is something called interference. And the interference coming from self one causes self two to fail because it's always there in their head. Now, there's a little formula, very complex formula, Capital P equals lower P minus I. What in the world does that mean? Performance equals potential minus interference. And what Galway says is a little self-doubt, an erroneous assumption, the fear of failure was all it took to diminish one's actual performance. So the more you have the negative self-talk coming in, the more it's going to impact your performance negatively. And so he has this magic triangle Three things you need for change. You need awareness that you see the situation with clarity. You know what deal you're in, okay? You have to make a choice to go in the right direction or to go in a desired direction. And you need to trust in your inner ability to do this. Now, once again, this is not a linear journey. You know, this is more like Candyland. But it kind of looks like this where we go from level to level We start out with no knowledge, we learn, we practice, we practice some more. We realize, boy, change is hard. And then something happens, we fail, but that's learning, okay? So we recover, hopefully, and practice some more. We may fail again, that's learning. We practice some more, eventually one day we'll reach a level of mastery. Now, this may take a period of years. Okay, that's why it's so hard. And you may need to unlearn some things. That's very common in in sports and just about anything. I've been doing it wrong. I need to change. Uh, Repetition is not a bad thing. How many of you remember this scene? Yes, wax on, wax off. Don't you love it? Mr. Miyagi. And why was he teaching Danielson? Karate by doing wax on, wax off. It was repetition. It was getting a habit. It was making a pattern. And um, one of my clients is here, and I was talking to her yesterday, and she's learning a new computer language. And she was saying that she felt kind of guilty because she had to keep going and reading the same things over and over again. I said, don't feel guilty. That's normal. That's good. Repetition is a good way to reinforce things. Now, here's where I think we want to be, okay? We, you've probably seen this where you have this quadrant thing where at first you're bad, but you don't know it. This is the unconscious incompetence level. This is the American Idol audition level, okay? People have been told all their lives, oh, you're such a good singer, so now they get on television and they're such a horrible singer, but no one ever told them and they didn't know it and you just, oh, I'm sorry. And then number two is the conscious incompetence level where you're doing things badly, but at least now you know it. And you say, man, I need some training in this. 
You know, I really stink at this. Then you have number three, where you're consciously competent. You, you can do things well, but you really have to think about it. You have to think about that swing. You have to think about how you're going to do this test. And you're always wondering, am I doing the right thing? And then you have the fourth level, unconscious competence, where it just, it just looks natural. You make the free throw, and you don't even think about it. You swing the bat, you play the guitar, you play a song, you don't even think about it because you've done it so many times. And actually, more than a quadrant, it looks more like this, where you, you have these little iterations of, of going from naivety to discovery to discouragement to learning, you know, kind of like what we've just been talking about. Now, one other thing, i got to wrap up here, the idea of a dialectic. F. Scott Fitzgerald said the first or the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. The reason that some of us can't see other options, and this applies at the personal level as well as the organizational level, is we can't see the other side because of biases. So we have one technique we see as bad, one technique we see of our, as our favorite. Both have good points, both have flaws. The reality is both can be helpful in certain contexts, but we don't see it because we're too immersed in our own view. Like, some people hate test plans. They think they're not worth the time. Other people think test plans are great because they define the scope of testing. Both can be true. Test plans can be helpful, but they're only a plan. They may not work out as planned. You know, it can be concise. You don't have to waste a lot of time with it. That's probably the more reasoned position there. Now, I have a thing about implementing these things naturally, okay? I think if you try to roll out too much too soon, you're going to fail. So I prefer kind of a natural way to grow. Now, there are two options. There's the organic approach. I don't know if this house was in Colorado or not, um, but there's a lot of stuff growing there. And it's kind of out of control. Maybe some of it's smokable, I don't know. But anyway, it's, it's just everything growing up. And I've been in organizations where that's how their testing is. Versus what I call the planned organic approach, where it's like a garden. And you have things laid out. And you know what can grow where and when. You know, you know what requires shade and what requires a lot of water and a little water. So the planned organic is a natural way to implement learning, implement practices into your organization a little at a time, and you get better and better, and you don't try to do everything at once across a 100 people or whatever. So the final thought here, which is good because the clock is down to zero, uh, <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell, of course, he's written some really, really great books, and the Outliers book, he, he makes the observation that the 10,000 hour rule is a definite key in success. And what he means is if you do anything for 10,000 hours, you know, that's a definite demarcation point for people who are very good at something. You may wonder why I have a picture of the Beatles up here. Well, from uh, 1960 to 64, they went, they made three trips over to Hamburg, Germany. I took a college course on the Beatles when I was in college. It was a liberal arts college, but still. Uh, I don't know. The Be learning about the Beatles is amazing. But anyway, they performed over 1,200 times, amassed more than 10,000 hours of playing. Before they started playing in Hamburg, they were known as the worst band in Liverpool. Maybe the worst band in England. I don't know. But when they came back from Hamburg, they were the best band. And because they were playing seven days a week, many times eight hours a day, they would play anything. And if you can find some of those early recordings and records, uh, you know, that there's no doubt about that. Okay, now it's time to put this into practice. I'm going to challenge you to do something. Uh, in your conference bag, you have a, a book of notes or places you can take notes, okay? The, the sessions you go to, I'm going to challenge you to take at least one or two things away out of that session. Write them down. Don't let them roll around in your head. Put them on paper. Even if you don't think you're going to act on them right away, write them down. And at the end of the conference, if you can find about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, make a list of about 10 or 12 of them. 
and draw a couple of lines in there. One that will demark the short-term things you can do in about maybe two or three months. Another line demarks the midterm, and the other one will be the, the long-term, the year or more. Now, personally, and, I, and this will be in your slides, in your notes, you can see this, I've come up with my own set of principles that I like to apply, like for test automation, for test design, for test evaluation. I would challenge you to arrive at a list, a set of your own principles, not just a list of things to do, not just the things to try and fail at, a list of your own principles with your own implications, the way that you can do things best. Because what that's going to do is it's going to empower you, okay? Regardless of what you have permission to do at work from your boss, you can still do this, okay? You can do this for you. You can do this for your own learning and for your own profession. And with that, I say thank you very much.